just want to say thank you all for coming out. My name is Jimmy Dulabakis. I'm one of the co-founders of Entra. We're a social network for entrepreneurs. Uh, we put on these monthly events to help you connect with uh, like-minded entrepreneurs, investors, freelancers, artists, innovators, uh, to help get your ideas off the ground or get your business to the next level. Uh, this is where it all happens. And um, we thank you guys for coming out. Next week we have our no-code summit at Microsoft. Uh, if you don't know how to code and you're scared of coding, it's a great event to come to because there's actually platforms where you don't have to code and you can build a great app. Uh, but before we go into this interview, I just want to introduce our sponsor and, and, and partner, uh, Daniel Vera from Spaces. How's everybody doing tonight? Welcome to Spaces at the Chrysler Building. So we've been here at, at the Chrysler Building since July. This is our flagship location in New York City. It's a great building to be in. Uh, it's an Art Deco masterpiece that we were lucky to get here. We have three floors here. You guys have uh, free day passes to use. Next time you want to come in and just have a place to work, feel free to use them at any of our locations uh, in New York or even worldwide. So we have 300 locations worldwide. We're opening up our 100th location in the US in Raleigh, North Carolina later this year, which is fantastic. So you can get anything from a membership to an office, uh, we do a lot of business with Entra. Uh, they're a fantastic organization to be with. So you guys are going to get a lot of value out of this. So if you guys have any questions or want to just talk about office space, I'll be walking around. Feel free to talk to myself and my colleague. We're here for you guys for anything you need. Thank you very much and enjoy the show. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you. Right. Just full disclosure, our office is actually in this building. So this is awesome. So let's move into the interview we have. Who's this? Richard Lorenzo. Mr. Lorenzo, come on. All right, great. If you can't hear us in the back, just let us know. We'll talk a little louder. Uh, so we're here today having this interview. Why do we do these interviews? Because we want to hear stories from successful entrepreneurs from New York or from other cities that we host events at. Uh, so Richard, your your company is Fifth, Fifth Avenue, Avenue Brands. Brands. Yep. What is Fifth Avenue Brands? So Fifth Avenue Brands is a public relations firm and we specialize in doing media relations for B2B companies. Uh, we do a lot of work in the financial space. We work with hedge funds, private equity firms. We do a lot of policy work. Um, and we work with a lot of B2B technology companies as well. Okay, so here you are. You have this cup. Can you hear us? I can't hear anything. You can't hear us? Okay, okay. we'll talk a little louder towards you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> you in the back? <laughs> What's that? The acoustics really are muffled here. There's okay. also a lot of seats yeah, we have about seven seats in the front if anybody wants to come up. Okay. So, why did you become an entrepreneur? To make money. <laughs> I, I started my company when I was still in school. I was still in high school, so I, I was really young when I started. Um, and honestly, at, at first, you know, I really was just looking for a way to make more money. Um, and I was really interested in the internet. I was interested in, in computers. So I started thinking about how I might be able to use that to build a business that wasn't shoveling snow or selling lemonade or you know all those different things that I'd already done. Um, so I started teaching myself how to code at 15 years old. I learned how to code. I learned how to do search engine optimization, uh, content marketing. Keep in mind this was very early on when digital marketing was still very new. Um, but I started selling that as a service to small businesses locally. And that kind of morphed into a marketing agency, um, which evolved into the PR agency that, that we are today. My mom was a reporter, so I, I grew up around newsrooms, and around journalists, so I kind of understood the business. And I realized after a while that rather than being a full-scale, a, a, a full-service marketing agency, um, we could do a lot better for our clients and better for ourselves if, if we specialize in one thing, become the best at that one thing. Um, and that's how we became a PR agency, uh, probably when I was about 18 or 19. And so I'm, I'm 27 now, so it's been a good run. Have yeah. you ever have you ever heard of the book, uh, One Thing? One uh, Thing, yeah, Gary, Gary Keller. Keller. Has Gary anybody Keller. heard of this book? Gary Keller's book, One Thing? No, you should check it out. It talks about focusing on the one thing that will make you and your company grow. Uh, so your dad was a fireman. My dad, yeah, my okay. dad was a fireman. So your mom's a journalist, your dad's a fireman. Yep. Both put out fires. Yep, right? pretty uh, much. What, I mean, you got into marketing, like I understand why, mm -hmm. like I can understand why, but like, yep. why did you pick that? Like you could have picked 
a couple other different avenues. Uh, why'd you end up there? And why'd you start a company at 18 years old when everyone else that your age is going out having fun and yeah. just enjoying college? Yeah. Well, you know, it was a combination of interest. I was interested in, in marketing and I was interested in technology and the internet and building websites. So uh, as I learned to code, for example, or as I learned to do SEO, I discovered that I liked it and I, didn't, I enjoyed it. Um, and then obviously the other factor that weighed into that was the fact that I could do it online virtually um, and being a teenager living at home in my parents house there wasn't a lot that I could do in terms of going out and meeting big corporate clients so but what I could do was pitch people by email um, meet people through you know online networking what was social media back then it was very early um, but it was it was very accessible so the internet allowed me to kind of compete from where I was growing up on Long Island in my parents' house, getting clients all over the U.S., um, and I did enjoy doing it. Is what I learned as, as I got more and more into it. But I had no idea when I first started that you know it was going to become. I wanted to build a company. I wanted to be successful, but I had no idea that it was going to be like this that becomes this big thing. Twelve years later, that I'm still doing. So you're young. You go yeah. out and you start reaching out to clients. What like? Do, do it's like, slow. Yeah, it's <laughs> slow. Was, it wasn't busy. <laughs> No, it wasn't. <laughs> believe it or not, it wasn't booming in the beginning. Um, but I would use, you know, I would use um, online communities and forums. This was back even before LinkedIn, so that there were, you know, forums back then where a lot of small business owners would network, and I would join the forums and I would cultivate relationships with people and tell them, you know, that I was an expert in internet marketing and I could sell you these services. Um, I would email local companies and, and pitch them. Uh, I kind of learned how to write pitch letters from my mom because she was a journalist. And for anybody who's familiar with journalism, there's a lot of pitching involved in being a journalist. Journalists pitch their editors, they sell stories. Um, so I learned how to pitch and I started reaching out to businesses. It, it was very small in the beginning. I would find a local business who would pay me maybe two or three hundred dollars uh, to build a website for them or to do some kind of digital marketing to, to grow their traffic. 12 years ago, companies had no idea whether or not it made sense to really spend serious money doing this, but it, it was still kind of new, it was a new frontier. Um, and as I did a good job for those clients, it started leading the referrals, and then the clients got bigger. Um, when I was uh, 16 years old, I closed a six-figure client uh, completely virtually through the internet, never having met them in person. How old are you? 16? I was 16. Did they know how old you were? They didn't know. They didn't know. Okay. 16. <laughs> That's what <laughs> <And laughs> <laughs> they They thought it was probably you know, like 30. Or, and it, luckily, the founder of this company was also relatively young. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't 16, but he was in his late 20s starting this new company that ended up becoming a really successful consulting firm. Um, and he took a shot on me and with a very small order and, and over time as I did better and better for him I, I scaled up what we were doing uh, and that became the launching pad to really begin like building a real company because I could reinvest that money into my own marketing building a team um, and also being able to watch him build his business was kind of like a uh, like a remote mentor for me that that also you know even more than the money that I made from it was probably the best thing I got out of it um, He's still a client to this day, and he was the best man in my wedding several years ago, and he's become a really good friend. So you never know where those relationships are going to lead. Absolutely. And, yeah. and let's take a step back. You said something about pitching. Yep. Which is something that we do in in, in uh, entrepreneur you know, uh, industry. What, yep. What does it take to pitch, and what is pitching? Like, how do you formulate a pitch? Mm -hmm. And, like, what did you learn from your mom on yep. how to pitch that? Well, it... You know, it, it needs to be short and it needs to communicate the value right away in those first few sentences. So in, in journalism, we have a saying called don't bury the lead, um, which basically means, you know, don't wait until the third paragraph of your pitch to actually get to the point of what the meat is, what the hook is. Um, so creating a pitch that's short, that has a hook right there in those first few sentences, and then using another paragraph or so to build credibility about yourself, what you're doing, the project, maybe some recognition that you've gotten through media or maybe through some awards or an incubator program you might have been in uh, is the formula that we still use to this day when pitching, we pitch hundreds of companies to, to reporters every single day. Um, short pitch, start with a hook, and then build credibility around why you're the authority and why people should listen to you on it. Okay, yeah. so now you're full-scale PR company mm -hmm. in tech, policy, 
Yeah. First, let's go into tech first, and then we'll okay. go into policy after. Uh, how do you do PR tech? Uh, yeah, tech and PR, like, like yeah. PR and tech. I mean, actually, yeah. how do you do that? Like, mm -hmm. why is it important? Yeah. Do you work with apps? Like, have you worked with? We do. Uh, like, what companies you working with, and how yeah. does it work? So we work in the B two B space, and we do work with a lot of SaaS, like B two B SaaS and, and software companies. Um, what we found works best if you're a software company or a tech company or really any kind of company um, if you want to build a story around what you're doing and get attention for it there's three things that we look at which is number one uh, the founder or the team behind it what kind of journey did they have building this what kind of obstacles did they overcome the more that you can put a human face or, or really personalize what you're doing and what the mission is the more compelling that story becomes um, so a lot of times we'll have an interesting founder or a rising star in the company that we're able to build a story around and that becomes something that is very interesting for the media, can also be interesting for investors. Um, and then the second thing that we'll look at is how is your company impacting the market uh, or, or the, you know, whether it's the environment, the world, uh, the community, uh, because nobody wants to read a sales pitch about the, the benefits and the features that your product does. But they do want to read about, and again, this kind of also humanizes what you're doing and your mission. They want to read about what you do, how it affects the community, what kind of impact are you having on the world. Uh, so the more compelling of a story that you can build around that, and especially if you can humanize it, um, that's another very compelling story that we found works really well with press. Um, and then the third thing is, uh, you know, so you have the founder, you have how you're impacting the, uh, you know, the community. And then the third thing would be, a lot of times we'll build an interesting story around a specific case study, uh, whether it's a client that you had or somebody that you impacted, if you're a nonprofit, somebody that you helped, um, a difference that you made, building a story around that, and again, really personalizing it, because that's what sells a story ultimately. So we had an interview uh, a couple weeks ago at, at Microsoft with an entrepreneur, and yeah. he explained that do not pitch your product based on value, what the value is. Mm -hmm. Like for $59, you can get this. Nobody yep. cares. Yep. What they care is, do, can they trust this product? Mm -hmm. And why should they trust this product? So does that line yep. up with what you're saying? I would, yeah, I would agree with that 100%. You know, sales, pitching, um, it's all about cultivating trust. And you're generally not going to cultivate trust by being the lowest priced player in, in the game. Um, that may work in some markets, you know, maybe, maybe you're Walmart, I don't know. Um, but for the most part, it's sales is about building trust and you want to build a relationship. And the way that you do that is by, again, personalizing your messaging um, and, and showing, you know, the why behind your mission uh, and the difference that you want to make rather than just trying to be the lowest cost supplier. So have you gone into a, like a tech company, let's say, mm -hmm. and you, sat that, you sit down Yep. You go through this process, right? Yep. Have you ever had founders that were not seeing the same vision? Or were seeing sure. kind of slightly different viewpoints on what they were doing? Sure. Um, you know, we've especially seen that in companies that have multiple founders, uh, multiple, co like four or more co-founders, which these companies do exist, believe it or not. Um, it's, it's very diff difficult when you have four or five partners who are all very strong personalities and they all have a very specific vision for what the company, what they want the company to be. Um, and, and sometimes you can even see that with, with two founders, you know, two co-founders in a startup. Um, so there needs to be a conversation around uh, how can we build a coherent message and an identity and a mission um, that we both see eye to eye on. But there also has to be some compromise there uh, in terms of you know, what can we actually get done and, and what can't we get done based on the resources that we have uh, the talent that we have, um, and why we started this thing in the first place, you know. So you work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What's your take on, on uh, you're an entrepreneur yourself, but yeah. did you work with them? Yeah. What's your take on entrepreneurs? Like, what do you, <laughs> what, what happens when you see them? What do you think about them? Like when you, not on a personal level, but like on a business level. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we work with founders across the spectrum of literally just started up last week to you know more than a billion dollars in revenue and and um you know the things that are consistent are founders you know they're they're visionary 
um, they tend to struggle with a lot of the operational aspects of the business and as a company scales they usually do better by bringing in a team and, and building um, people around them who can complement those weaknesses um, but you know what do we look at when, when we want to work with the founder is we're looking for somebody who more than anything has a lot of focus and discipline that can stick to one mission for long enough to, to see it through a lot of founders have shiny object syndrome they call it where um, you know today it's AI tomorrow it could be ethereum you know and th then it's going to be something else um, it's it's very hard as a founder as a visionary to be able to say well I'm, I'm going to stick to this one thing for five years if that's what it takes or ten years to make it work um, when the inherent nature of being an entrepreneur is you look for opportunities and you see them everywhere uh, so that that I would say more than anything has been an indicator for us when, when we go into a company um, where it's still an earlier stage company the founder is very active and figuring out you know is this a company that's probably going to make it we look at you know what's the focus and you know the perseverance of the founder and are they going to be able to see this across the finish line without iterating you know maybe a million different times that completely takes them on to a different course why do you think the shiny object syndrome mm -hmm. why do you think they do that like is it is it is it like they're trying to find validation in what they're doing it, it's probably it, it's probably a, you know a combination of things i think all founders are a little crazy <laughs> that's not true um, that's, it's not true at all but um, <laughs> you, you know it, again it's, <laughs> it, it's the inherent personality of being yeah. a founder yeah. you know, is you want to build things founders are not signing up to start a company to be a manager yeah. you know they they want to build things um they're doing it because they see opportunities and they want to take advantage of those opportunities and those same good qualities that enable people to go build companies uh also derail a lot of companies if you don't have the right team around you who can help you control some of those uh some of those urges i guess yeah so you're 12 how many years in 12 12 years 12 in. years in yep have you ever had to fire a client oh yeah all the time Tell us, tell, do you have a story oh. <laughs> that you can tell us about something? Oh, yeah. I probably shouldn't tell a specific story. Is you, this you on can, camera? You, you, yeah, you can use like X, Y, Z. So <laughs> it's, it's the same as any service business. You know, you're, you're going to have clients who, number one, you're going to have clients that are just difficult. You know, for whatever reason, there's not a personality fit. Um, and that can be toxic to a company, especially in the beginning. If you have a client who's treating your team like crap, no matter how much they're paying you, um, you know, there's going to be a point where you have to weigh those those pros and cons and figure out is this a client that's good for the long term health of my company? And if you have a client who's bad for the mental health of your employees, which we've had, um, you need to make a decision and, and you know say is this worth potentially uh, you know hurting the team, losing employees that could be very good players on our team, um, or is it going to be easier for us to go out and get a new client? And a lot of times it's easier to go out and get a new client rather than going out and finding new talent. Um, so th there needs to be a personality fit. Um, you know, there are always going to be clients who have unrealistic expectations and, and no matter what you do, it's never going to be enough. Uh, you need to be able to recognize that and either find a way to manage those expectations, which is not easy, um, or make a decision to part ways. Um, and then also, you know, it's, it's a tendency of a lot of new companies, especially in the service space, to take on clients who are not the ideal client, whether it's because of product market fit or because of fee size, just because they want to get money coming in the door. Um, and that works in the beginning, that might work the first 12 months, but it doesn't work long term when it's very difficult to build a sustainable business on small dollar clients or clients who just are not a good fit with, with your specific area of expertise. Um, and there becomes a point in your growth cycle where you need to make that decision and start getting rid of some of those clients. And it's scary in the beginning, um, but it, it's kind of just one of those things where you need to take a leap of faith. And you know, you may not have another client in the pipeline that to lined up to take that place. But you've once you make the decision, uh, it's amazing how much easier life gets, and it becomes easier to to continue growing the company. Yeah.